session 13. This is Mountain Plain, part four. So there are four other sessions that are all dealing in the same particular passage. So if you're like jumping into this, and you're like, I wasn't here the last three Wednesdays or two Wednesdays or you missed some, understand I'm not doing an intense amount of recap on those. I'm just kind of mentioning where we were at so we can continue on into part four. I fully expect this to take this Wednesday and next Wednesday. Uh, so there will be a total of six parts to this for Mountain Plain. Um, for this. So by the time it's all done, that is roughly give or take six hours of audio video recording footage and roughly going to be somewhere in the vicinity of around 50 pages worth of notes uh, on this, just this particular area. This is one of the largest um, sermons, actually the largest sermon that we ever get uh, of Christ from Matthew's perspective and from Luke's perspective. Matthew's is called the Sermon on the Mount, which most people have heard of or you've heard mentioned or something maybe. Uh, and then you have one called the Sermon on the Plain, okay? The Sermon on the Plain, Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about this in all prior weeks. I'm just going to say this to refresh your memory. Is Some people say, well, it's just the same thing, just you know, two different accounts for it, but it seems to be it was the same message given at two different times, one at the top of a mountain, one at the bottom of the mountain, within a very short period of time, if you read the opening remarks as to kind of how we get into this, this kind of session and, 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 and that Jesus is having here, um, we see that one happens at the top of a mountain as they're coming down a mountain, then they do it at the plain, so it kind of seems like a bunch of people heard about it, came, and Jesus decided to do it again. Luke's is significantly shorter, but kind of covers all the same things, uh, and we have already read through all of Luke. So what we've done in, in part one, we looked at Matthew and Luke, primarily Matthew, and what is commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, all right? So that's the blessed are the these, blessed are the these, which we're just going to kind of see today. And we looked at what Matthew had to say about it and what Luke had to say about it. We dove into Matthew on it. Then week two, we kind of flipped and went a little bit still with Matthew, but a little bit more with Luke. And then last one, the, the last session that we did was all Luke. We kind of just talked about where Matthew mentions these things, which we're going to see over the course of this week and next week. But we focused in on Luke, finished out Luke, and read all of that. So we know what the Sermon on the Plain holds. We know what the Sermon on the Mount it holds. Basically, now we're diving into some of the details around this. So there's a lot to unpack with all of this, as you can tell. That's why it's taking six sessions. Um, I, we, were, we were asked to kind of slow down with this, you know, and try to make sure we got through it in detail. And I'm very glad that we listened to that wisdom um, because we would have just glossed over a lot of stuff like we always do. Come on, who's honest? You read scripture and you're just like, cool, I read it. What did I read exactly? You know, and so we took some time. We're really diving into it um, to understand the really the essence of it. And what I mean by the essence of it is this: a lot of times, and you're going to see that in a few things that we read today, we read it, and what we're looking for is specifics about life instead of understanding its generalizations about a spiritual walk. So again, I'll say this every week, probably like this, this can be our new thing we can put on the side of our walls, you know, which is all scripture is given for spiritual understanding and natural application. We have to keep that in our minds constantly because that's why we walk away with script, from reading scripture and we say, okay, because we're reading it, expecting it to, to tell us something, you know, that it's not trying to tell us. It's trying to help you understand spiritual things and then learn how that looks when you walk it out. There, there's a, a really great little... Uh, C.S. Lewis was giving a, a speech at a... Uh, uh, this is a long time ago. Obviously, I was not alive. Uh, <laughs> this was, this was uh, back in the, the, the 40s, if I'm not mistaken. And they asked him a specific question about what it's like for, for a, a factory worker to come and to know God versus like the businessman. And he says, I see no difference. Why does it make a difference what the person does with their life, in their life as to how they come to know God or Christ at all? And he says, if you're looking for Christianity, Christianity doesn't tell you how to make the meals. It just tells you to feed the hungry. If you need to know how to make the meals, you got to go get a lesson in, you know, in cookery or something, right? And so... This is, cookery is a word, uh, <laughs> but, and a lot of times that's what we do, right? We go approach scripture and we're expecting it to just say, 
here's the ingredients, here's how you do it, here's the specifics, and you're good. And really, it's more trying to tell you these are the things that should happen, this is the way you should think, and then when we walk out life, we start to apply that to every situation. Does that make sense? So it's important to know about how we need to read Scripture. So let's jump into this. I think we're kind of ramped up as to where we're at. Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain. We're going to start at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount because we've already done the entire Sermon on the Plain. And you'll notice in the notes, if you have the notes up, you'll notice everywhere it has a title of like a, a specific area of text. So like, for instance, right here, it says the Beatitudes. Here's the Beatitudes. shows you where it's located in Luke, so the Sermon on the Plain. And then it shows you what session we covered it in. So I can understand how this is like, okay, but we did talk about it, but which session specifically? So I put in there, you can go back and watch session seven right there, and it will cover that in detail. Make sense? As you go through all that. So let's just start from the beginning. Sermon on the Mount. We see a crowd coming up to Jesus at the top of the mountain. He sits down and he starts to teach them, and he opens with this right here. He opens and starts to teach, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And he goes on and on. I'm not going to read the entire thing because we dug into this in detail. Okay? Now, again... We also understood all these things are spiritual heart motives, right? Like th- these, aren't, these aren't like, oh, because you're, you're, you notice it didn't say blessed are just the poor. Specifically the poor in spirit because we're talking about spiritual things primarily, okay? So we dove into that. And after that, then we see something that we also did an escape room on, which was salt and light. Which what we see here is this entire conversation about saying, hey, you're supposed to be the salt of the earth. But what happens if salt loses its savor, loses its purpose, its flavor, the thing that makes it the salt? It's good for nothing except for just to walk on, right? It it says it's good for nothing. But, you know, what good is a light if you hide it under a bushel? No, right? Y'all remember this? So this, we need to see this. This is in direct connection to those attitudes we're supposed to have, to those spiritual conditions we're supposed to have. Blessed are the these. And he's saying, so those conditions, those things, those heart motives... When they are, you are the salt. Does that make sense? So he's connecting it, saying this is what makes you that, or all of these things that I just listed. Y'all see in this. See, most people don't put those two together. We just teach, be the salt of night, and what does it mean to be the light? It means to shout Jesus from the rooftops, Jesus saves, or to put billboards that say you're going to hell. One of these, like this is shining our light. No, it's saying the actual character that you house is the thing that makes you this salt and light. Y'all see that? Okay. This is all recap. That was covered in session four, okay? That was like nine sessions ago. (laughs) And then we see this, and this is where we're going to pick up right here. Christ came to fulfill the law. All the way back in session one, we started talking about this idea of fulfillment, if you remember that. It's the very first session. It was a Wednesday night, uh, not unlike tonight, except for y'all were more vigorously enthused about the vault series, and we're 13 sessions in, and you're like... There's a lot more to talk about. Yes. So all the way back, if you can remember, if not, go back and watch it. Session one, this big idea came out about fulfillment, and it comes out in all four Gospels constantly everywhere. But Matthew really, really hones in on it. And it's this idea of fulfillment. And we're going to read this and start from here because Luke does talk about it, but he doesn't talk about it in his Sermon on the Plain. Okay. So we briefly talked about fulfillment, but now we're going to jump into it. Now, what I would like to do is uh, jump right over here. And actually read it uh, directly out of the King James uh, for this particular one. So right here in verse 17, which is where we're going to start, it's right after salt and light. In verse 17, so this is Matthew 5, 17, it says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one, some of yours may say, iota or jot or tittle, or it may say a dot, uh, depending on yours, Um, this way will pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. So let's stop right there real quick and let's talk about this. Um, I even said it a couple Sundays ago because it's actually kind of a country saying, which is funny. It's like, not one iota. Well, if you don't know, actually, an iota is actually a Hebrew letter, okay? <laughs> and it's the smallest little Hebrew letter. It's like a little little dash kind of looking thing, and it's a letter, uh, and it's the smallest one of them. So that's actually where we get the word an iota, is like the smallest little bitty thing. And then the other one is uh, that is called a, a tittle, or a it is sometimes it's called a dot. It's another Hebrew Greek letter that is another little different dash that they use, things that we don't use in English, all right? But if we can think of it this way, that there's not one 
I not dotted, you know, one T not cross kind of a thing, okay? That's what we're supposed to get out of this, okay? So that's what that part means. But let's look. So I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. So the reason he makes this distinction is because what he's referring to with the law is what sometimes is referred to as the Mosaic law, meaning the law that came from Moses, okay? So this fully, mostly all focuses on the Ten Commandments. Very rarely do we see many things that when it, people say the law, do they mean like all of it? They're really saying like the Ten Commandments and then, and then the other stuff, but primarily the Ten Commandments. The reason that it means primarily, does it mean all? Sure. But primarily the Ten Commandments, because if you actually look at the Ten Commandments, and we'll see this this evening, they're not really like how society should run so much as they're about your heart towards God. And most people miss that when they read off the Ten Commandments, which like are on buildings all over this country. And most of them are actually, if not all, I, I would argue actually, in my view, I would say all, are actually to do with a heart motive towards God more than about this, the way society should run in actions. Okay, And that's actually what Jesus comes to say he's going to fix. And we're going to read that here in just a minute. Okay, Now, are there tons of other laws? Yeah. In, in the uh, Hebrew culture, they're at this point, I think they're in the 400, 600, some, I mean, they're way up there. But at the time that Jesus is referring to it, there's closer to a couple hundred at that point or something like that. And I mean, there's some all the way down. I mean, let's, guys, this is, we're all adults in here, so we can just have a conversation. There is laws in the Bible that if a woman is on her period, she can't, she has to like put a bucket outside the tent and can't sleep in her husband's in the same tent. And like, could, you, could y'all imagine that? <laughs> it's that time of the month. Bachelor day, like for a week. Like, no, like this is weird. Why? This has to do with their society. Okay. But we cannot take that logic and then say, so all of scripture is just their society. And this is where we don't rightly divide the word. We want to take one thing that is, is true here and just say, well, if it's true there, it's true to every single thing I read in the Bible. I can just say it's culture. No, you can't do that everywhere. There's certain things that you can, certain things that you can't. You have to learn how to rightly divide. So what we can understand is that most of what Jesus is referring to, if not always, is always spiritual in nature and is always tied to a heart motive. So he says, I didn't come to destroy all that law, that, that moral, moral law. I didn't come to do that. That's not, I didn't come to make it easy for you, okay? <laughs> Nor the prophets, meaning all the prophecies, all the things that they have said would happen. I didn't come to do away with that either. But what did I come to do? Fulfill. Now, again, refer to session one. If you want to understand the meaning of fulfillment, it means to make whole, complete, finish, that kind of an idea. He says, this next one, till heaven and earth pass. Now, This can be taken in one of two ways, okay? Heaven and earth pass can be taken as what you will commonly hear people say, which is until heaven is destroyed and disappears and then earth is destroyed and disappears. Or it's what's called an idiom, which means heaven is supposed to be the eternal realm in which God dwells, which last time I checked, God doesn't get destroyed, so where does God go during this time? So he's making kind of like a, this ain't going anywhere ever idea. Like it would take both of these things disappearing and no longer existing. Now I hear some of you in your head and you're quoting Revelation. What you need to understand is new heaven, new earth. The word new there means renewed, not like a brand new. And we talked about it on Sunday. God does not make all new things. He makes all things new. And that's very different, right? Making all new things means I destroy and get rid of old and I just create something brand new. But that's not what scripture tells us. It does not say that God makes all new things. It says he makes all things new. And we see that from Genesis and we see that in Revelation. So now I'm going to pause right here on all this. This is going to be the fun part, okay? If you want to have a conversation in detail about this, because there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about, I am going to, after this session, okay, we are going to cut end session 13, and then I am going to have a kind of Q&A talk about this verse 18 uh, right here and 19, okay? If you want to go into a little more detail about it, okay? So now let's keep reading 19. We're just going to keep going here, all right? Verse 19, so whosoever shall break even the least of these commandments and teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall teach them the same, so meaning to do these, he's called great in the kingdom, okay? Okay? 
So I'd like to point out just one thing about this, and then we're going to leave this part alone and keep going on, and we'll talk about this at the end if you, if, like I said, if you want to. You don't have to stay. You can leave. Uh, but anybody who wants to, it's going to be a fun, interesting conversation. Um, but right here, notice it says not just if you do them, but you're also teaching people to do it. This is where we get the idea that they shall know them by their fruits and stuff. It's going to be sampled. So basically what Jesus is saying here, it ain't just about can you keep your crap together long enough. It's the fact of whatever it is you're doing, you are teaching somebody. You are someone's underling and someone is learning from you. If you have children, this is 100% true. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say it. So if we look at our children and how they're behaving and how they are, so if you don't have kids right now, you know, no worries. Um, but you are still teaching someone. Remember that. So this applies to all. If you have children and you look at how they're behaving, how they view God, how they think about this, how they think about that, understand you taught them that. Now, again, if you want to give yourself an out and say, well, they got friends at school, you taught them it was okay. I take full responsibility for anything that my children do, and that will go until they are no longer in my house. And at that point, it's like, it's your decisions, you know. And God gives us a promise with that, by the way. Train up a child in the way they should go. And it doesn't say they, hopefully, maybe not, they'll, no. It says they won't depart. At some point, they will come back to it. But the issue is we may not be training them in the way they should go. So we continue on, shall we? So you're teaching somebody. You're actively propagating. We talked about this too. We don't like to hear it this straight. But this is what Jesus is saying. You're actively propagating. Disobedience or obedience. There's no in-between here. One or the other is what's happening. Now he'd be called the greatest in the kingdom. My mother, uh, speaking of, I may, I may need to answer. I may not be respecting my mother. <laughs> uh, so the greatest in the kingdom. So this is good. Now, keep in mind, remember what else Jesus says. We're going to see this in the future. You want to be the greatest in the kingdom, what do you do? Serve. So by doing the commandments, what are you doing? Serving God. So you notice this little correlation between these things. Let's continue on. Verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what is he trying to say right here? Now this right here, your righteousness, this idea of your righteousness, this is not to be confused with man's righteousness. Okay, This is not meaning that if your version of righteousness, like the one that, you know, that Ariel thinks is, well, this is my righteousness. This is the best, you know, this is, that mine is better than theirs. This is not a comparison like that. This is saying the righteousness you are obtaining. Guys, we talked about this in week one as well. What righteousness are we obtaining? The righteousness that Christ gave us. So he says, this is the one you're supposed to have as being my follower. So unless you obtain that, which is exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees, in the scribes, now the Pharisees and the scribes, we've talked about them quite a bit. They were guys who could quote this scripture back and forth, left and right, and could tell you how it all works. But Jesus is constantly saying, you're not so bright about this. How do, how do you not understand this? What are, you, what are you not getting about this? Because the spirit was completely removed from it for them. It was a simple action laws, and it was religion. And so he's calling that out. Because what is the word righteousness? It means an upright state or the state one ought to be in. So unless the state that you ought to be in is the righteousness that Christ has given, which exceeds the way the state that they think they ought to be in. Does that make sense? He's drawing this comparison saying, here's how the Pharisees think up righteousness works. Do this, do that. Sacrifice this, do it. You know, who cares about your heart? Just do the thing. He says, unless it goes beyond, exceeds doesn't mean necessarily better than either, it, but it means to go further than. So this an extends further than this, okay? So let's continue on. Now, here's what we're about to see. Now, you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, real quick, I do want to say this, actually, before we read this next one. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Who's ever heard the two different phrases? You will find that the term kingdom of heaven is only found in Matthew he doesn't, he, he's the only one that uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Everyone else uses the phrase kingdom of God. They're kind of a one and the same idea. It's just Matthew's way of saying it versus everyone else's way of saying it. Matthew does use the phrase kingdom of God as well, but he primarily uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. So don't be confused by that because that's kind of like saying I'm at my house and, I, and I'm, all, where, where, you know, I'm always at my house and saying, oh, we're going to Jared's house or we're going to 
see Jared. It's the same thing, right? Like, because God and the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, the way God does things or the way things are done where God is at, which is the same because God has all authority. Make sense? <laughs> okay. So, right here, what we're now about to see is what's called antithesis. So what we're about to see is six antithesis. We're about to see six times, back to back to back, that Jesus says, here is a law. Here is something you've heard the scribes and Pharisees say. Here is, and the first one he kicks us off with, actually, is a Ten Commandment, one of the, one of the big ten, you know. He kicks us off there, and he says, this is what you've heard, but here's what I'm going to say. Now, some people I have heard take this completely out of context, and here is the context it should be taken in. It should not be taken in the context of, well, see, Jesus came to do away with it. We don't need him anymore because this is what they said, but Jesus says this. See, we try to make it like Jesus, you know, we're playing. Y'all ever, like, watch people play limbo? And when it's, like, the the kid or whatever, or they're high jumping, and when the kid comes, they lower it. Right when they jump, they're like, come on, you can try. Yay, you made it. And they're, like, adjusting the bar constantly. Y'all ever seen that? Yeah. That's not what Jesus came to do, and that's not. He didn't come to say, well, the bar seems to be set too high, and no one can achieve it. Let me just move it down here. No. He actually sets the bar higher. Now, all of you in your head right now are going to such religious, you're such a Pharisee. You see. You're all going to, but that was so hard to achieve, it's at the bar higher. We can't even do that. What if I do the wrong action? And you refer to Sunday. You're all over here, and you're not looking at it properly. What we should look at this as is Jesus says, here, let me show you the completion, the fulfillment of that law. Let me show you the completeness of what that really meant And not how man had turned it into this wicked, let me just get the right action. Let me dabble right on the edge and just do it to say I did it. And so I can make it to whatever I'm supposed to make it. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're missing the whole point of this. The spirit is completely removed from these laws for you. Let me fulfill it and put the spirit back in it. That's what Jesus is doing here. So it sets the bar to a whole nother standard. And here's what he says. You've heard it said by them of old. Okay, that's basically saying by our ancestors, by the Mosaic law. That's what he's referring to. He says, that thou shall not kill or murder depending on your translation. Everyone, right? That's one of the big ten, right? That's kind of, I think every society in history has kind of used that as a pretty good guide of, hey, if we're going to survive, quit killing each other. Yeah. So he's saying, hey, this is what you've heard. And whoever kills will be in danger of judgment. And this judgment is a dual meaning. It it does mean like the judgment of the people around you, but judgment meaning like a separation of, like, so you're going to be put to death as well, right? Especially in Texas. You kill someone, we kill you back. Okay? So he says, this is what you've heard, but now let me fulfill this for you, right? Because where are we at right now? Think about it. Now, uh, uh, should I ask this? Has anyone killed anybody? Okay, so let's, let's uh, <laughs> how much have I thought about it? Uh, no, no, so, well, we're about to see that, aren't we? Uh, so, let's think of how we're looking at this already. Just in reading it, what are we doing? Haven't killed anybody. Check. We're good. Yes, success. We're at least making a 10 on this 10-question quiz of life. Got 10% accurate. We're looking at it this way unfulfilled, incomplete, as an action. And what does Jesus do right here? He says, but I say to you, so now let me fulfill this. Let me take it and fill it out for you. Let me color in the picture for you. He says, whoever is angry with his brother shall, uh, without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which we're going to talk about in a minute, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, uh, therefore, let's keep going. We're going to read this whole thing. Therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar, there remember that your brother had ought against the, that you have ought against your brother. Leave your gift at the altar. Go away. First, be reconciled with your brother, and then come back and give the uh, uh, and, and give the gift. Pause. So, Sunday, when you come and you get ready to pray, <laughs> as soon as you remember. This is what Jesus is trying to tell you. As soon as you remember that you're mad at somebody and they're not here, you better leave and go call them because you're not worthy to be in here until you get that taken care of. No. It's not what Jesus is trying to point out to us. See, again, where are we at with that? Action. Tell me exactly what to do, how it works out. We want to know the ingredients and figure out how to cook instead of him just saying, let me teach you that you're supposed to do this thing. 
We're, we're, we're looking at it all reversed. What is he trying to get at? He's saying, listen, you've heard this action. Let me fill this out for you, color in the picture for you. I'm going all the way to the heart motive. Every time we see in here, Jesus goes to a heart motive. He says, if you are angry, and I've heard people try to do this too because they want to walk that line, oh, without cause. I got a good cause. No, see, that's already being the arbiter of good and evil, which is supposed to be God's responsibility, not yours. So if you're the one trying to determine what was good and how you have a good cause or not, you've missed the whole point. That is a prerequisite for this conversation. See, so if you, if you miss out on that first part of the conversation, you're missing out a huge variable and you're going to twist this word into making yourself justified instead of letting your justification be in Christ. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so he says, if you're even angry at your brother without cause, you're in danger of the same thing. He just literally compared killing somebody to anger. Now, can y'all imagine, if, if we do that today, everybody says, well, he's just being crazy, and Jesus did it. And not just here, by the way, in other locations as well. So it, you, could even, you could even write it off and be like, well, Matthew just wanted to say it that way. And all of them get that general premise from what Jesus said, that he is comparing these things, which means he compares the heart motive to the end result action because Jesus understood something that we in our thick heads just can't get, is that whatever is in the heart, the actions end up doing. You don't fix an action and then the heart becomes right. You fix the heart and the actions change. And Jesus is pointing that out right here, saying the anger. And then he goes on, and he uses a specific example from their day, which is whosoever shall say to their brother, Raka, is how you say that. That is a Hebrew word, and this word literally is like, an, in their day and time, it's like an extremely derogatory thing to say. Like, in our day and age, there was a be a few MFers, this and that and the other. That would be like the equivalent. Like, think about the most derogatory thing we would have to say towards somebody and that's what this means to say. And it specifically means to be someone empty or vain or like empty headed, like not just like stupid, like, oh, you don't, you're not intelligent, but this idea of everything about you is empty. Why would that be such a derogatory thing to say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is without form and void, empty. And it doesn't become something unempty until the spirit's there. Y'all see where this vain emptiness is saying, you have no, no spirit, you don't know God, you don't know God. That would be, see, in our day and age, that means nothing, just to tell you that. But in their day and age, that was everything. You're going you're gonna to put that evil on me, Ricky? You're, you're going to go to that extent to say that I have no, I have no life in me? I have no, I'm void, I'm empty? So this is a big deal. He says, you'll be in danger of the council. We should not get caught up in this particular state. When he uses the idea of counsel, hell, hellfire, or, or judgment, what he's doing is saying, because if you did this to, to, to your brother in their day and time and you said that, you know, then you may end up going to the council of your local village. So he's saying the same thing. It's judgment. He's just directly tying it to something they would understand, a council of people to say what, what, what's happening here, that they become the arbiters of, Okay. You shall say, thy fool. Who's ever heard this one? Call no man a fool. This is basically Matthew's way of saying this. is what, Okay, the word fool is Greek, and it means the same thing. You ignorant, empty-headed, vain, void person. So he's just doing it. Why? I already told you why in session uh, part one of this. He's talking, and he knows his crowd. So he doesn't just use something from the Hebrew culture because he knows he's also got a bunch of other people with him, so he's using things that they would have also understood as well. Okay. Let's continue on. Therefore, this, this, is, this is the good part to me, guys. Therefore, bring your gift to the altar. There remember that thy brother had ought against thee. There's something huge that's happening here that we skip over. We just read it as when you're about to pray, because that, by the way, you know, giving an offering at the altar would be like praying, singing, reading your scripture. All of these are our offerings. They're all a form of worship, okay? Giving your money, whatever it is, okay? All of those things. So it's saying, when you go to give your gift at the altar, and this, so specifically at the altar, remember in their day, they had to do it at the church. It's, it's slightly different than here, actually very different than, than, than how things are done nowadays, okay? So it says, while you're there, notice what it says do. Remember. 
that your brother has ought against you. It already talks about you having ought against your brother. Now you've also done something to tick somebody off. And you remember that you've done that. Not remember, not remember what they did to you. Remember what you did. (laughs) This shows us something too, though. This shows us what happens when we approach God in worship. He will call to remembrance things that he needs to deal with you on. This shows us how the Spirit of God works. David puts it to his best in Psalms, I think it's 139. David says it this way. He says, search me, try me, see if there's any wicked way, twisted, messed up way in me. See if I haven't done these things. So what is, what is Jesus even showing? He's pulling from that right there because he knows, he knows the Psalms. And he's saying, when you go to worship, when you go to bow before God, when you go to say, my life is devoted to you, God, when you go to do that, you're going to remember. Remember, search yourself. Don't search your other people. Don't go praying that God fixes their heart. It says search yourself and find what is happening here. And let God deal with it. We're right back to God being the arbiter, by the way. Y'all seeing that? He says, then, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to leave the gift there. Now, there's a lot to be pulled from this that we're going to see as we continue on. So you've got to remember this next week, okay? I know that's tough. Remember something for one solid week, like a candle. So what does he say? It says do, it says you don't actually give the gift yet. You stop, you just set it down. (laughs) And then you go and you reconcile. The word reconcile literally means to become one again, to get back on the same path. I like to think of it this way. This is Jared's redneck definition. To reconcile yourselves in God. To be brought back together and be reconciled in his grace, his mercy, his, whatever's needed in that moment. Be reconciled with your brother at that moment. Then come back and offer the gift. This is what we get if you've ever read scriptures that have to do with like um, t- communion, and it says, you know, hey, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, this is what this is referring to. It's saying, when you go to God, you notice it says to give, so you're in the process of worshiping. What is going to happen? The Spirit of God is going to come and say, if you're doing it right, this is one way to know if you're worshiping right. Yeah, there's a wrong way to worship? Yeah, absolutely. Scripture talks about it all the time. It covers a whole lot about that. The right way, which is to be humble to God and saying, hey, search me, try me. I want to be your servant. He says, when you do that, when you're in the process of that, you're going to remember some things (laughs) because I'm going to deal with you and correct some things. And what I need you to do then is shift your worship into action with your brother. Do you see this? Something that begins as a direct spiritual understanding that God gives you is then supposed to turn into an actional change in your life. This is Jesus fulfilling the idea. Action comes later. But the heart motive must be changed. He says, then you come and offer this gift after you're reconciled. Then you come before me. And guess what God's going to do is say, rinse and repeat. Let's do it again. Now, verse 25, this is kind of another idea. Now, this is all still under the idea of thou shalt not kill. Are y'all seeing this? Has he given us another command yet? No. He's still focusing in on this idea of, 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 of murder, of, of, of kill, of, of slander. He's, he's addressing this pretty heavily, right? Starts off with anger, and then he starts off with your heart towards if someone's upset at you and you're upset at them. And now he goes even further. He says, agree with your adversary quickly. While you are in the way of him, this means like while you're in front of him, while you're together, lest at any time your adversary, or some of you says the adversary, but this is not a definitive, this is like an adversary, delivers you to judgment, or to the judge, and the judge delivers you to the officer, and then you'll be cast into prison. So what he's doing here is actually telling you exactly what would happen (laughs) in their day and age of if you get into a dispute with someone, right? Right? About money, land, a cow, 
whatever, you know, maybe a camel, I guess, in their day too, in their time, right? If you're in a dispute with someone, Jesus is saying, figure out a way to make it right, right then, right now. Keep unity there. Because if you do not, you could be on your merry way. And then in their day and age, they're going to go to the judge of of their little area. Then he's going to go to the officer of of the courts kind of a thing, if you can think of it this way. And then they're going to throw you in prison because you are in a disagreement. Okay, What is this assuming, by the way? If you're the one getting thrown into prison, you're the one in the wrong. That was not accidental. Okay? You notice the assumption of every single one of these so far, and you will see it won't stop, is your fault. Y'all aren't going to like when we get to the part about lust and divorce at all, because we're about to get there. We'll get there tonight. I'm making enemies real quick, honey. Agree with your adversary quickly, meaning the one who is against you, or you deem to be against you in this case even, right? It says, what did it say at the beginning, right? Your brother has ought against you, meaning you've transgressed your brother. Now it's saying the adversary, and it's written with the assumption that you're the one in the wrong. Jesus never lets you be the victim. Not once, not one iota. (laughs) Not one time does he say, play the victim. He says, you look within yourself because if you're in my strength, you can take correction all day long. You don't feel beat up and shamed when you're constantly getting corrected by my spirit because it's not condemning you down. It's not shaming you out. It is convicting you up forward to him. And you can take it all day long because it doesn't feel, you don't feel like, oh, I'm doing so horrible. It's like, I am starting to see the way things are being done in God's realm so I can be a part of his kingdom. And so it's constantly looking at it from the perspective of self-evaluate, quit pointing the finger everywhere else, quit looking at everything else. I could give you an example specifically with marriage, but I'll hold it just in a minute. Do y'all notice that? I'm reading from your Bible. Assuming, this is all assuming that you're the one getting cast into prison. And we breeze that, don't we? We just read it, oh, you'll get cast into prison. I don't want to go to prison. Don't kill anybody. You're missing the spiritual notion of what Jesus is trying to communicate to you. Be humble to his spirit. (laughs) And let me just throw this in here too. This is also assuming you're not the one to decipher what was right and wrong in the situation. (laughs) See, I swear, people don't read. (laughs) Verse 26. Very last hand to you, that by no means... Shall you come out until has paid the utmost farthing or like penny, like it's, it's a small denomination, meaning every cent is paid for this thing. Now, this is an interesting piece right here. So he's right. We're talking about this your, your, like self-evaluation and everything like this. And what does he now go? He says, when you get thrown into that prison, you ain't coming out till everything gets paid. And then we sing songs. Here's a really, really old one if you know it. Jesus paid it all. What is he doing? G- guys, Matthew, Levi was his, his real name. He's not dumb. He knew what Jesus was trying to communicate and what Jesus said. Luke, not dumb. He knew what Jesus was trying to communicate. So he writes it in there purposefully for the way that Jesus was saying what he was saying to help. It's like the, the best foreshadowing you can get of like, hey, by the way, <laughs> I got the shame in the prison part covered if you can stay humble. <laughs> Are we starting to see the gospel message just like right there? <laughs> okay, let's continue on. Don't worry, as excited as me. All right, here's the second. Don't worry, that was the longest one. The next antithesis is faster. <laughs> yes. I can speak parcel tongue. Uh, okay. <laughs> that was for Harry Potter people. All right, verse 27. You have heard it said by them of old. All right, now here's a new one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Boom, pulling from the top ten again. 
But I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman and lusts after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And then verse 29, And if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is more profitable that one of your members should perish than that the whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, um, And if thy right hand offends thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is more profitable that one of thy members perish than that the whole body is cast into hell. Now we stop. Now we're going about to get to the next one. Let's break this down real quick, shall we? I told you I'm coming for you, right? I'm coming for myself too, so let's just go. First off, this is another one. Jesus is about to do what? Color in the picture. He's about to fulfill this law. See, we always think fulfill meaning like he filled it. Yes, he satisfied it. But also fulfill it meaning I'm going to get you the full picture. You're going to get the full picture of what was meant by this phrase. So we always look at adultery and think, okay, we're all natural people, so most of us think, Have I cheated on my wife? No. Am I currently doing it? No. Because it may be one of those things. (laughs) Checkbox. But this word adultery, the word itself carries a much deeper understanding. And yes, I'll go ahead and cover a little bit of cultural things before someone with their, you know, spiritual, Semitic intellectualism of things spiritual and Semitic being of the Semitic culture and people, intellectualism, intelligence, okay? Meaning like you're tying all this stuff together and you're looking and saying, well, in their day, only adultery could be committed by a woman sleeping with a married man or if that man slept with a married woman. So if they're not married, it doesn't count, which is actually one of the arguments in the days of Jesus, which is why he brought this up. There's actually a huge argument going on. Just put this on for size. These are supposed to be God's people, supposed to understand the heart of God. And this was their argument about adultery, is that, okay, here's how adultery works. And they literally have extra laws, not in your Bible, that some are in your Bible, and then they have extra ones being written, which was, well, here's how it works. Adultery is only a man sleeping with a married woman. So if she's not married, free pass. And it's only if, she, if it's only adultery from the woman's perspective if she's married or if she solicit, solicits it, so if you're a prostitute. And then they're like, well, but, it's, but adultery is also like sleeping with your family member, which is a part of it as well. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, who's my family? They're, this is the little argu- literal arguments of their day. Because what they came to decide... <laughs> This is the Israelite people. (laughs) They came to decide that it was within your tribe. Everyone outside of your tribe, it's not adultery. Literally, this was their kind of core decision. Meaning that out of all the 12 tribes, as long as she's not in your tribe, you're good. What if she's married? Well, that's fine. She's not in my tribe. They literally twisted this all the way into that. And so no wonder Jesus brings this one up. (laughs) Because he's like, you guys are crazy. (laughs) So he brings this up, but we also need to understand, see, we are natural beings. Yes, everybody touch, you know, you're natural. So all you think about is natural things. But Jesus is trying to take you to a H&L, a whole nother level. He is trying to redefine and fulfill this for you. So yes, there is this physical act called sex that is involved in this. But that physical act is not the checkbox. It is the physical thing that shows you the issue of the heart. And what is the issue of the heart with adultery? It is holiness is the core issue. Because I can't stay dedicated to one thing because what if I miss out on this other thing? And I desire this other thing. And so this whole idea, Jesus is trying to fulfill out with us to understand holiness. Dedication. That is why, one of the reasons why, sex itself, which is supposed to be one of the most intimate things that a human can do with another human being, the whole idea of it, why why was it supposed to only happen in the bounds of marriage? Because once marriage is set, it's supposed to be a holy, dedicated union, never to be violated. So he's tying it to that for us spiritually, saying, when you see this in your natural life being an issue, just with natural urges. No, there's a heart issue of dedication and holiness. Then he takes it a step further because the word idolatry also means worshiping of idols. They would use the same word. 
See, we think of it, see, we say, we're worshiping of idols. That's not just, you know, that, that's, that's bad or worse than cheating on your wife. Like, we can get by with that. Blah, blah, blah. No, for them, it's like, this is the same thing. It is all what? The word is unholy. It is all undedicated. It is all separated. Every single bit of it. No distinction. Now, before you get up on your high horse and think, well, <laughs> I don't worship idols. I don't have any Buddhas or anything in my house. Idols is not literal meaning a statue and a figure. It means anything that takes form and shape in your life that takes the place in which God is supposed to hold. That could be money. That could be, you've heard it, cars, money, houses. Okay, it could be a family member. My wife and I were having that conversation just the other day about it because I was saying God is a, a member of my family. And she's like, yeah, but I wanna, I, I, sometimes don't you think that people can actually put a family member above God? I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I guess they could do that. You know, God is supposed to be the head of house. So he's a member of the family that's the head of the house, which means everyone in the family just does whatever the head of the house says. Next time on your IRS form when someone says head of house and just put God, see how that turns out for you. <laughs> Don't tell them I told you to do that because then I'd get arrested for like tax fraud or something, I'm sure. Like they'll find a way um, to put me in prison until y'all pay everything I won't get out. Uh, <laughs> so what is this idea of adultery? Y'all see in this, this is, a, this is a huge thing. And we like to pass it off as if like it's just a sex thing. So once I get married, and as long as I don't cheat my wife. No, this idolatry thing is a heart motive. That's just supposed to be the, that's the meter to show you, not to try to say to correct the issue, which, yes, should the issue be corrected? Yeah, but the only way to get it corrected is over here with spiritual view. Okay, y'all aren't liking me. So he says, that's what they say, this adultery thing. I say if you even look, because that's what the lust, lust means to desire or to perceive desirous. Is anybody hearing Genesis in this at all? Anybody? Bueller? What does Genesis talk about? Genesis says that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was desirous. And what did Eve do? She saw it and said, it looks good. So this is a direct call. Nobody? Is that not just like, wow, these guys are pretty smart. He says, you've already done this thing. You've already desired this thing. You've already became unholy to me. Now, does that mean you're beyond saving? No, because remember, that part's paid for, provided you stay humble. Because what is Jesus doing right here? Right back to the heart motive. These commands, he's trying to fulfill them, show it to you and say, these commands were not an action list. These commands were heart motive things that I needed to address. Hmm. Let's continue on. Because so now he gives us these two things. Y'all cool? It's, it's summertime. We're good. He says, if your right eye offends thee, pluck it out and get rid of it because it's profitable. That one piece of your body perishes, then the whole thing. And then the next one, he says hand. So he says the same thing twice, but he uses two different examples, eye and hand. There's basically three things we need to understand about this as far as words go. It's the word right, like right, left, right. And then eye and hand and why he says it twice back to back. So the first thing is right. Why didn't he say your left eye? I'm kind of partial to my right one. This is an idea in that day and time that we largely just don't quite get, which is basically if we were to sum it up in a very, very simple idea, which is something on the right hand or on the right anything versus the left is the place of authority in the place of power, the place of honor, the place, so what is honor? To give weight to. What is authority? Means I listen to. So this idea of right, that's what it is. So that's why he said right, not left. Left is the idea of dishonorable. Left is the idea of something unwanted, undesirable. Okay? So why does he write it as, she found synonyms for undesirable. <laughs> what is trying to be communicated to us by this idea of right. The thing of authority in your life. The thing that you give weight to in your life. And so what two things does he use the eye and the hand? Why? Because one has to do with desire and one has to do with action. Something you put your hands to. 
Again, we read it and just say, oh, you looked at a woman and we just see, you know, here comes, here comes Albie and he's like got a patch on. But what happened? Oh, I looked at a girl today, man. So, I, you know, what? Like, no. And like here we see Ryan coming in and he's, he's got no hand and he's just like, my name is Stavi, you know, or something like that. Like, no. What is this meaning? This is saying the thing that you give honor, you give weight to in your life, that you give authority to in your life that you desire, something that you're perceiving and desiring that has the place of honor you give weight to, and authority in your life. Get rid of it. Because it is better that you lose that one thing than you lose your whole self in the process. So then what does he say? Right hand. The things that you do, that you are giving more honor and weight to, more authority to that you do in your life, get rid of them because it is better that you get rid of that than you are relegated to the whole thing itself. Does that make sense? He gives this to us another way as we'll keep reading. Which, did you know Jesus was divine? Yes? And you are the branches. (laughs) <laughs> but this is, this is actually, y'all want one more joke? Yeah, 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 okay. Who was, I just learned this one, so it's good. <laughs> Who was the most business savvy, savvy woman in the Bible? The most business savvy woman in the Bible? Pharaoh's daughter. She went to the bank of the Nile and pulled out a little prophet. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, but I didn't come up with those myself. I was really bored waiting on a video to render, and I was watching dumb jokes. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, the vine in the branches was not just the joke I was giving you. It was an idea. We hear it later that Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He says, any branch that is not fruitful, I cut off. This is what he's trying to talk about. Look with, What are we back to? Look within your own life, and it is better that you... Release, let go of the things that you deem as more important, more honorable, the more the things that you give weight to, that you desire, that you perceive, and the things that you do, if they are overtaking because they are causing you to be unholy, meaning undedicated to me, they are causing you to be idolatrous. Do you see how he's just fulfilling it? He's just filling it all in. He is Bob Ross in us right now and just covering the whole canvas. I don't know, Bob Ross the painter. This is your world. Okay, he's painting us the full picture. Okay, y'all aren't getting it. Okay, let's keep going. So if your right hand offends you. Now, whoops. Here we got, here we got another one. It has been said. I want you to notice this too, how Matthew phrases it. This one says, it has been said, who shall ever shall put away his wife, let him give her a, written, uh, a writing of divorcement or a certificate of divorce, yours may say. Notice the phrase change. What do the last two say? You have heard it said by those of old. And then he quotes a command from the Mosaic law, from the laws of Moses. But you notice this one, he does not say from the days of old, which means your ancestors, those who are worthy and honorable, that whole idea is what the days of old means. And he doesn't quote scripture. Now he just says, you've heard this said. Why? This is something new and added later on. And so he's actually directly, we don't see it in our day and age because we're reading this as if it's all at the same time. What has happened, he he is now directly addressing the shifts and the changes that the Jewish people have entered into their belief in God and what God said to do. And they're allowing themselves more and more and more leeway. And so he's not gonna tie them together and say they're equal. He's saying, no, these things are one thing. What you're hearing right now is just things people are saying to get their way. Does that make sense? He's changing right here, showing us a dynamic shift. And so he knew who his audience was. And that's why he's saying, now, you've heard this said. How many things, just think about this in your own life, evaluate this. How many things have you heard said about God in the Bible, but you go back and you can't find it? This is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, you heard people say this stuff about how you're supposed to do things, but that has no root in the heart of God. This is just something someone said. You're seeing that. So he says, you've heard it said, a man shall put away his wife. Meaning, if you're going to leave your wife, just make sure you give her a piece of paper that says y'all are divorced. Get it approved, you're good to go. 
which is exactly how we look at it today, by the way. And so I am going to hit a little bit on marriage, not because this session is about marriage specifically, but because I am coming more and more to a realization. I, I, believe, I feel very blessed and fortunate that I uh, have a, a, a lovely wife and all that kind of stuff. Yes, but fortunate that God has, has allowed me to be placed in a, a situation in which I get to communicate and talk with lots of you guys, all different couples, and hear from people who have been married 50 years and people who have been married one year, people who want to get married. And, and constantly, it's actually really great because I don't think if I was doing this constantly, like communicating about marriage, I would probably be as, as uh, focused on being a better husband. <laughs> so it's almost like trying to help other people out helps me out, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of the person in this that's, that's always messing it up. But I, I say that to say I'm very fortunate, so that's why I want to, because I'm coming to a realization that none of us understand marriage at all, not even in the slightest. Um, the more I see it in Scripture, I'm just like, whoa. I would almost put to you that the act of marriage is probably, should be, not is, but should be one of the grandest acts of worship that we have. And none of us view it that way. But I'm finding that more and more in Scripture. So I say that as we read into this, because I am going to talk briefly about marriage, because that's what Jesus is talking about right here. So what he's saying is, you've heard it said that if you put away your wife, meaning if the man decides, I don't want to marry you anymore, uh, just give her a, a writ of divorcement, saying that you're no longer married, and there's a lot behind this and stuff like that, but just the basics is saying, you're now divorced for any reason, because you want to do it. Which is exactly how we look at it. Which would be what? Unholy. Undedicated. So he, we're tied right to the same idea. And what does he say here? But I say to you, so that's what they say. But here's what I'm saying to you. That whosoever shall put away his wife, saving the cause of, and uh, King James says fornication. Some of yours may say uh, sexual immorality. Um, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is divorce, commits adultery. Now this I have heard this taken in so many ways. This is the reason you can't, you know, be in leadership in a church because Paul says something about this. This is, you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> this is doing two core things. Number one, it is filling in the gaps for us to say, this is what other people are saying. What is this tied to? Desires. Any reason I deem worthy, which Jesus just said in the verses before, cut it off. Anything that I deem worthy to what? Separate. And Jesus says, there's one thing here. One thing that could, that could do this, which is what? Unholiness itself. Fornication or sexual immorality. It's the same word as adultery. It means the same thing. It's talking about the spiritual desire and it's talking about this natural one. But even more, look at what Jesus does right here. I say to you, if you put away your wife, save for this adultery reason that she's committed, you're causing her to commit adultery. So it's your fault. <laughs> Still, Jesus just doesn't let you off the hook. Y'all don't see that. It doesn't say, you know, well, if she, you're still causing the issue here. We like to, Taryn and I use the phrase, the marriage mirror. It's always just a reflection. Mm -hmm. Now, whosoever marries her, that is divorced, they're committing adultery. Why? This, this is not some super uber spiritual whatnot that Jesus is talking about here. He is not trying to, to say, when you get to heaven, you'll have too many wives. Like, this is not what this is about. What he is trying to show you is the sanctity of this union and how it's supposed to be lived out as holiness. And what he's trying to say is that if you're trying to get rid of this, this thing that you committed to, and then the only reason you even could is because there is a commitment, you're causing the very thing that you're trying to get away from. You're seeing that. It's almost like any way you can conceive to fix a problem ends in death, chaos, and destruction. That would be called the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of hell. And so that's all you can do. The only way that this is resolved is in the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus is trying to get everyone to understand. He's saying, and the only way to do that is to stay completely committed in holiness and unity. 
that went over. <laughs> wow. Let's continue. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to leave it alone. All right, let's keep going. And again, you've heard it said by them of old. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So now we've shifted back, right? Now we're looking at something that was said. And you've heard it said by them of old, thou shalt not swear of yourself, but you should perform unto the Lord all of your oaths, meaning basically you should not swear upon anything in your natural life, of your life, or anything like that. Any oaths that you take, you should take before God, right? So that marriage, all these things. Y'all getting this idea, swear, it's, it's saying that by, by the power of God, or this, that, that, and the other. This is what you should swear to. So this is actually an Old Testament law. It's in Deuteronomy, if I'm not mistaken. I think I put it in your notes. If I didn't, I'll go back and add it. But watch what Jesus says. But I say to you, Swear not at all. Now, before, real quick, let me just fix this. Swear does not mean like, ooh, you said a swear word. Swear means like to, I give my promise, my, 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 my oath, like what, I, what I'm saying. And what does he say? Swear not at all. Neither by heaven, because that's God's throne. Like, so keep your mouth off of it. Nor by earth, because it's his footstool. Even the place that his feet goes, your mouth ain't worthy for. So shut it. Neither by Jerusalem, so not even by a part of it, because that's for the great king. Because, okay, Jerusalem, city of peace, prince of peace, peace. Okay, this whole idea. Neither shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. Because you swearing by your own life, you can't do anything about it anyways. And then he wraps it up with this idea. But let your communication be yay, yay, nay, nay. For whatever more, all that comes is evil. And I want to put this on for size because I live this all the time. Let your communication, everything that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> Y'all aren't going to like me at all. I may need to turn and face the vault. Or maybe I'll open the door, get behind it, and shut it. <laughs> all of the words that come out of your mouth to each other and to everyone, let it be. If it's a yes, just let it be yes. You need not say more. If it's a no, let it be no. I need not say more because everything else that follows from that is evil. And the word evil, there's the word paneros, which means full of labors, annoyances, and toils. Because see, when you go start talking to people and you're, I promise, I promise, I promise, what does it do? It adds weight and burdens to you to fulfill something that you've said, even though you've overcommitted. Because I do that all the time. I have a good heart, guys. But I am horrible at scheduling. I just my grandmother's laughing because she knows I, I I fail at this constantly, but you know what it should do? It should call me to one remembrance of another scripture that says, "From out of the heart, the mouth speaks." So if we're seeing our communication not be exactly and dedicated to what it was, we are seeing our own level of undedication or unholiness. This should not be a thing of, I, just, I said yes, yes is yes, my word is final, you just do it. or what? No, that's not what this is saying. It's saying you should be so dedicated, so focused, so much in it that everything you say is what you mean, you mean what you say. And not, I'm not talking about miscommunication. I'm saying if I, if I said I'll do it, I'll do it. If I said I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Oh, y'all think, oh, for someone else. No, how about in your own life if you said I am going to serve God in this manner and in the next day you don't? Or I will not step into this realm because I know where that will cause me to go, but yet you do it. This is dual play. Yes, it is to other people as well. So it's saying you shouldn't have to promise and do all this stuff because all that's going to come from that is labors, annoyances, and toils, anxiety, everything, because you're trying to create and say and do. And, and, and oh, it's, um, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and attack this and we'll, we won't bleep it out because I don't care. Uh, <laughs> this is like the whole thing. What actually comes from all this name it, claim it, jibber jabber crap is this evil, unrest. Because now people think that the purpose of the Spirit of God within you is to create more things, and so now they are caught up in evilness. I didn't say they're bad in nature and they have bad hearts. All I said was what you get caught up in is now I am trying to fulfill what I have said because I said God was going to do this thing, and God may not really have said it or, or not. Uh, and then so now i got to make it happen to make sure my word is fulfilled. And now you become the one that is making things happen. And it all falls apart very quickly. 
Didn't know we could get all that from one verse, did you? I said, I love it. Y'all not love it? I used to say, I like John. I think I like Matthew. I don't know, maybe I like both of them, but it's good. All that comes from this type. So from out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we see our communication not being holy, dedicated, singular, keep your eyes single, remember? If we don't see it, that, that is not to say, oh, you're so horrible. That is to say, self-evaluate my heart is not as dedicated to the things I've said it is supposed to be dedicated to. See, because this is the other thing. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we say all the time, which means he, his word is constant, you know, consistent, never changing. And so if you're supposed to be in his kingdom doing it how he says to do it, everything you say is God, so it won't change. So it's not that hard to say yes and no because it's always the same answer. No matter the circumstance, to everything, my answer is always the same. Y'all not catching that? This has to do with faith and trust. Because, see, if God is God, no matter what situation is under advisement, y'all don't remember what we were just talking about, right? We, we talked about that for the last, like, forever. Faith, trust in God. This is what he's trying to say. What are you laughing at me, Kim? <laughs> yes. And if we are there, truly, think about it. If we are there, what we are doing is doing what, the, what in, in Genesis we're doing, saying, oh, I'm so horrible. But that's in our strength because we're trying to figure it out and versus jumping right back over here and saying, no, no, no. I don't have to do that. I don't have to cover it up. I can stand right here in front of y'all and preach on a, a message in which I epically fail at. Everyone in this room that's ever heard me say something can say, yeah, Jared totally fails at doing what he says he's going to do. And, and, can so, and y'all could all totally say, well, Jared means well. His heart's in the right place. So what is that? That's, I, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm not as dedicated to the things I said I was going to be dedicated to. I got to reevaluate. That's, 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 what, that's what the Spirit of God does. It illuminates it and makes you not proud of it, but makes you totally open to say, yeah, that is where I'm at. But I'm going to God. I'm not going to try to fix that action. I'm going to go to God first, and he'll, he'll fix the action. I ain't trying to fix it tomorrow. I'm trying to fix, I'm trying to fix my heart, which would then be putting me in right standing. And the only way I do that is to Christ. 